Um, right, so I'm going to tell you about some progress towards uh, building the path integral for gravity. And the topic is a sort of strange one in that, uh, which, which I started to look into seriously a few years ago, actually in investigating uh, Jim Hartle and Stephen Hawking's work. And uh, the more you look into it, the more you realize that uh, the foundations are somewhat lacking. And uh, really the path integral has to be built from the bottom. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So, um, now, why is it not changing slides? Oh, here we go. So why is this important? Well, the path integral provides the most elegant formulation we know of, of the laws of physics. And here they all are. These are the ones we know of. Um, and I should say, I uh, was a bit worried that there wasn't any Russian among these uh, in giving this talk, but then I realized that Euler actually was in some sense, an honorary Russian, and he's right in the middle of the formula. So I guess I'm okay on that score. Uh, this formula beautifully summarizes all the laws we know, uh, gravity, gauge theory, uh, particles described by Dirac fields, and of course the Higgs boson. Uh, and I, I used to believe there might be something more than this, and many people claim there may be more than this, um, until, uh, in particular, the dark matter. But uh, recently we've pointed out that the dark matter could be one of the right-handed neutrinos, which is needed anyway to explain uh, the masses, the observed neutrino masses. So it could be that actually this is all there is. Uh, there's no evidence for anything else. Uh, no direct evidence, I should say, that, that there's anything else in physics. So all of this makes it more pressing to understand whether this formula actually makes any sense. Uh, is there such a thing as a path integral? And you'll see right in the middle of it is the imaginary number i. Uh, this is not a Euclidean uh, path integral. This is a real-time path integral, and does it exist? But before moving on, uh, having mentioned all these names, uh, I can't help saying we shouldn't forget that uh, Marie Curie probably was the first to discover observational evidence of uh, probabilistic uh, physics in quantum mechanics. And so she played a huge role in founding the formula. And of course, Emmy Noether, whose ideas about symmetry uh, underlie the standard model. So I'm going to talk about uh, interference. You see what what this formula tells you is that the laws governing everything in the universe is, are those of interference. You add up phases. That's the entirety of it. Every physical process is described by just some uh, addition of phases, phase factors, e to the i times an angle, and you add them up, and that gives you the amplitudes. Uh, Interference is basic to quantum physics. It's absolutely universal. And I'm going to end the talk by showing you some examples of uh, interference on a cosmic uh, scale, which may be observable in the not too far future. Of course, my real interest is in uh, quantum gravity and constructing a path integral for gravity. Uh, there's this beautiful old idea due to um, John Wheeler um, and developed by uh, uh, DeWitt and Feynman and uh, John Wheeler's student, uh, Claudia Teitelboim, now Bunster, and others. Uh, and it's a wonderful idea. It says that the amplitude to go from an, an initial three geometry to a final three geometry is obtained by summing over all intermediate four geometries just weighted with the appropriate phase factor. So what I like about this is it's a very definite proposal. It's extremely challenging to implement, but you know either this is right or wrong. Um, and it doesn't involve any new uh, free parameters or anything like that. It's a rather definite prescription, and it's one which I want to uh, explore further. So, oh, I see. Sorry, I... I'm just having trouble changing slides. Now, the traditional approach to defining the path integral is this one. You take a real-time amplitude uh, up here, and you analytically continue the time to 
it should say minus i h bar beta, uh, and uh, and then you get uh, exponential factor, a, a real exponential. Uh, this approach is of course the Wick rotation, but it's actually due to Mark Katz, who um, a mathematical physicist who learned about Feynman's path integral and realized that you could apply this trick to define it. And the Euclidean time plays the role of a inverse temperature. And typically when we do thermal equilibrium, we trace over the initial and the final states. Now this trick has dominated rigorous quantum field theory for uh, 70 years or so. But uh, I just want to emphasize a very simple point. Interference and thermal equilibrium are very different physical things. And so using a thermal description to, uh, to describe interference is, is very unlikely to, to always work. Uh, and of course, gravity is in general incompatible with thermal equilibrium, which is why the universe isn't static. Um, uh, 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 due to the, what's known as the genes instability. So this trick is particularly inappropriate for gravity. Uh, in spite of that, it is what is used everywhere. So what I'm going to describe is a different way of defining the path integral. Instead of rotating time, which is after all just a coordinate um, and more or less a dummy index in general relativity, uh, we, we deform the integration contour in the path integral. The path integral is an integral over the coordinates in the system, and we deform that integral, not the uh, sort of dummy index which appears in the action. By the way, I should also mention that you can immediately see if I follow this trick, I can't, do, I can't really do any dynamics because in order to do dynamics, I need to uh, prescribe some state at, as being initial and some as being final. And if I've lost the notion of time, uh, that becomes very difficult to do. I, I would have to analytically continue my initial and final wave functions and then somehow analytically continue them back. And that's uh, very difficult. But I'll come back to that in a moment, exactly what's wrong with the Wick rotation. So instead of uh, doing a Wick rotation, we treat the, the integral itself, the path integral itself. It's obviously an extremely oscillatory integral. You're integrating a phase, uh, all the fields and uh, the metric can in principle be infinite. So that phase is extremely oscillatory, but there's a very nice method for doing oscillatory integrals due to Picard and Lefschetz. Um, and they gave a very nice general criterion for whether or not a given saddle uh, is relevant to a real integral. And by that, I mean an integral along, real, uh, along a real contour, maybe very high dimensional contour, but a real one. Uh, and they gave this prescription or, or the, they gave this criterion, which tells you whether or not a saddle is relevant, uh, which is very important and very useful. Now in our work, we take a slightly different point of view to Picard and Lefschetz because the problem with their point of view is that generically in a nonlinear theory, there are an infinite number of saddles and their criterion starts from each saddle and says, try and determines whether or not it's relevant by following a certain flow. The trouble is that uh, that takes a lot of time and there's a simpler way to do it, which is to take the original contour and actually just flow it off the real axis uh, downwards on a certain uh, landscape, and, and it will then find the relevant saddles uh, itself. And these, it, just, it doesn't just find the saddles, it will find what are called uh, left shed thimbles. These are just the steepest ascent contours along which the integral converges um, uh, sort of maximally well. And uh, so the integral becomes absolutely convergent and then all sorts of nice properties follow. This is a strangely a new approach to defining uh, Lorentzian real-time path integrals. And it's, uh, it, it, there have been some mentions in the literature before, but not as far as I know with, in the spirit of actually using this to define them from the beginning. I'm going to sort of tell you the answer. Our definition of the path integral implies 
the following exact formula. So on the left, we have the sort of uh, guess, uh, Feynman's guess for the path integral. It's not really a well-defined formula, uh, but I'm going to define it. And then on the right, the, this is the answer that what you do is you find all the relevant classical saddles. They may, or may be real, may be complex. There's a definite way to do that. You have to sum over all of them. Uh, and I'll show you very simple examples where the sum is infinite. Then there's a phase factor, which is just the action of the classical solution. And then there's this integral over the Lefschetz thimble. Uh, that integral turns into a real positive probability measure, and that's in the sense of measure theory. It's a well-defined measure. There's a phase which is uh, which reduces to uh, Maslow's phase with the Maslow index in the semi-classical limit, um, and uh, all of this is integrated in, a, along a contour in the space of complexified paths over which the path integral is absolutely convergent. So it's, a, it's an interesting formula. It tells you that the classical theory actually organizes the quantum theory um, in a very definite way. But note that in this formula, the classical solutions can still interfere. Uh, there's no such thing as A, or generically, there's no such thing as a single classical solution. Uh, and in the examples I'll show you, there will be infinite, uh, an infinite number of relevant classical solutions. And then, uh, the hope is that this formula should apply to gravity. There, there seems to be no reason why we can't do the same for Einstein's theory of gravity. Now, let me tell you a little bit about highly oscillatory integral. And you, you may find this uh, surprising. Sorry, the sun has just come out. Uh, is that, maybe that's better. Um, and, uh, as you'll see, there are a few surprises to do with highly oscillatory integrals. I think pretty much every physicist know that it knows that if you integrate e to the i x squared, this is a well-defined integral. Uh, a typical prescription would be to cut it off at some finite r and then uh, send r to infinity. And you get a definite result. And of course, as r increases, this uh, converges uh, to, to the final value. The point to note is that this integral is not absolutely convergent. Obviously, if I took the modulus of the integrand, I'd get one and the integral would diverge, but it is conditionally convergent. May, namely, when you take the, when you add things up in the right order, uh, it, it converges. Now, uh, this is the way we deal with this uh, Gaussian integral by uh, contour deformation. Uh, we note that uh, we can change the phase into a real number if we just say x is e to the i pi over 4 times uh, y or s, and uh, that rotates the contour. And so the original integral along the real axis is equivalent to the integral along the yellow part of the curve plus two arcs at infinity. And then it's not hard to show that the arcs at infinity actually vanish in the limit that r is large. So instead of doing this incredibly oscillatory integral, the blue integrand, we do the integral with the yellow integrand, which is monotonically decreasing and the integral converges exponentially quickly. So it's obviously a much smarter way to do the integral. What about high? So what I'm going to tell you is a generalization of this to higher dimensions and eventually to infinite dimensions. Now, uh, most of us, uh, uh, well, I, I, I suggest you pose this question to your students. Can I do the same for a two-dimensional integral? Now, the naive way to do it is to write it as a product of two one-dimensional integrals, and that's in fact using a square cutoff in the, the space of X and Y, and then you'll just get the square of the previous answer. But why use a square cutoff? Why not use a round cutoff in two dimensions? Then you would write it this way. Um, but the problem here is you can do this integral exactly. You get e to the i r squared. And as you take the cutoff to infinity, there's no limit. So a two dimensional Gaussian um, uh, with a round cutoff has no limit. 
So this tells you immediately that somehow using cutoffs is not a good way to go about defining these integrals. You've got to be cleverer than that. Now, for example, now, of course, much worse in a path integral, if we took more than two dimensions, I'd have an even higher power of R here. And when we do this integral, it's not surprising, it's going to be dominated by R to the uh, D minus two times, uh, so something that gets really huge as the cutoff goes to infinity. Now that's physically incorrect because if a particle travels from A to B via the moon, the paths which go via the moon should all cancel out. Uh, cutting things off with a hard cutoff it does not allow that. So what you should do is cut is uh, smooth the integral with a smooth cutoff. So for example, let's take this horribly uh, divergent integral, insert a smoothing, and, and the form of the smoothing will not be important as you'll see in a moment. Insert a smoothing, do the integral, and you see you get a beautiful answer, which is some definite value. And then the corrections go like one over R squared as R goes to infinity. So you can smooth it and then take the limit R goes to infinity, you've allowed all the physical cancellations to take place, and you've got an answer which is independent of the cutoff. Now, actually, it's much nicer than that because the result for a smooth cutoff taken to infinity at the end of the calculation is, can be obtained without using a cutoff at all by using Cauchy's theorem. So let's in particular, just to make things simple, assume the cutoff function is singular only at infinity. And then what we can do is deform the contour onto a steepest ascent contour, like the yellow curve I showed you, uh, yellow contour I showed you, um, plus some arcs at infinity, and, uh, uh, and then take the cutoff to infinity. And what we'll see is that providing the cutoff is reasonable, all those arcs at infinity will vanish, and, and our original integral will be equal to the steepest ascent integral, and we can uh, forget all about the cutoff. So for example, take that horrible integral I showed you, this one, insert your smooth cutoff and deform the contour to the steepest descent contour, the blue curve here, it's, uh, it's going out at uh, pi over four again, and uh, plus some arc at infinity. Now something very nice happens. You can show that the arc at infinity, just by plugging uh, uh, this uh, L equals L e to the i theta into this formula, you can bound this integral at infinity and the bound, bound uh, uh, you can bound it by this quantity. Now you see what happens. If R is finite and L goes to infinity, I get zero. Uh, however, if I took R equals infinity first, uh, this would uh, this integral would di be divergent in L. So the order of limits don't commute. In other words, you must smooth in principle, you must do the calculation and at the end take the smoothing away. And if you do that, the answer is independent of the smoothing because the answer is just the steepest descent contour with no correction in the limit that R goes to infinity. So this is a really nice way of dealing with uh, oscillatory integrals, which enables you to make sense of integrals which would be otherwise uh, difficult. Now let's do an example, a quartic oscillator. Okay, so the simplest quantum mechanical model, which is not the harmonic oscillator. Uh, and so the potential is X to the fourth. Can we do the path integral for this uh, uh, oscillator? Uh, you know, it's an embarrassment that, uh, as far as I'm aware, the path integral it, it has not even been proven to exist for the quartic oscillator, the simplest thing you can show in quantum mechanics without the wick rotation, which, as I said, is really suboptimal for understanding dynamical questions. So here's the quartic oscillator. I've written it in this way, it makes it slightly more convenient, where I'm going to consider an amplitude, a finite time amplitude. So the time is capital T, but I'm going to parameterize the path as X of T, where, um, where the parameter little t goes from zero to one. It's just a convenient way of uh, doing things. And in particular, you can see that uh, this uh, hamilton jacobi formula is sort of very trivial to obtain uh, in this way. 
Now, the classical equations of motion look like this. And uh, immediately you realize there's a countable infinity of classical solutions. For example, if I insist the particle starts at x equals zero and ends at x equals zero um, and takes a, a time capital T to go from the first to the second point, um, there are infinitely many solutions because I can throw the ball to bounce off the wall once and uh, come back to me. I can either throw it to the right or to the left, uh, or I can throw it a bit faster so that it bounces twice before coming back or even faster bounces three times and so on. So there are infinite number of solutions which satisfy the boundary conditions and they are all relevant to the path integral. Uh, here they are explicitly, they're uh, Jacobi elliptic functions uh, which are basically nonlinear generalizations of uh, the sign uh, of trigonometric functions. And so um, as n, uh, the, the quantum number, if you like, of the classical solution um, uh, uh, increases, the amplitude increases and um, the number of oscillations increases. So um, here they are, the, these are the lowest few. Uh, this is uh, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three. And uh, this is their energy. Uh, it, uh, it goes like n to the fourth, and this is their action. Also goes like n to the fourth over t cubed, and we're going to use that in a moment. Now, we want to do the path integral over all the space of paths. And we have all these saddles. We've got an infinite number of saddles. So let's try and form a picture of the configuration space for, the, for all these paths. Well, every mode, uh, roughly speaking, there's one, well, precisely, there's one classical solution for each mode. You see, this is sine of roughly sine pi t, sine of two pi t, sine of three pi t, and each one corresponds to a classical solution. So we can think in, in terms of those modes. And then we want to complexify the mode coefficients and deform our contour from the real axis uh, here onto the contours of steepest descent. Now, as I mentioned, there are saddles, non-trivial saddle. This one represents the uh, non-trivial classical solution, which is predominantly that mode. Uh, this is the minus of it. And here is the trivial saddle where all the mode coefficient, where the mode coefficient is zero. So we started from this contour, uh, the real axis, and then we flowed it downhill. And uh, so what's the height function here? So the height function H is just the real part of the exponent I S. So, um, so if you take the magnitude of the integrand that depends on the exponential of the real part of the phase, and that is the height function, and you flow the contour in that height function to go downhill. And these are the exact uh, steepest descent contours. You notice there are three of them, one for each saddle. Uh, this is the, and these are the thimbles. These are the left shed's thimble. So uh, every mode, um, uh, every mode function is going to have, uh, every mode coefficient is going to have this structure in the complex plane. Let's talk a little bit about the wick rotation. Um, you see, okay, so having done this, um, the Lorentzian path integral is now convergent. And it's obvious from this picture that um, the, the real classical solutions I was telling you about are all relevant. I mean, they're actually on the contour, so there's, they, they're, they're obviously relevant at the beginning. Let's see how they behave under wick rotation. So let's take the Lorentzian theory and rotate the total time clockwise. Just turn it down to the imaginary axis in a continuous way. The classical solutions still satisfy the boundary conditions um, uh, because as I've written it, they were only a function of the parameter time t, which still goes from zero to one. So uh, all you're doing is changing some uh, parameters in the uh, in the action and um, uh, actually in the equations of motion and in the action it's just some parameter which changes but it it all takes care of itself 
And then as I told you, the classical action goes like one of a T cubed. So the real part, what we would call the, uh, the, the real part of the exponent um, ends up going like uh, minus sine three theta. And that's just by substituting this formula into IS. So now it's impossible for, um, so, so we started off at theta equals zero, where all the uh, saddles are relevant. We then dialed up theta, the action for each saddle decreased, that's fine. Uh, it's fine for a, a relevant saddle can have an action, an exponent, uh, with a real part of the exponent, which is negative, that's fine. But as you dial up theta, you see eventually this action becomes positive. Now it is a theorem that no uh, saddle with positive exponent can be relevant to a well-defined path integral. You simply can't flow down to a saddle whose uh, real part of, of IS is, uh, is greater than the real part of IS on the original axis, which is zero. So, uh, so, the, so what happens is that the non-trivial classical uh, classical saddles all disappear in the rotation to imaginary time. They all become irrelevant. Conversely, recovering their effect from an imaginary time calculation would be exponentially difficult. So this shows you that the Wick rotated theory will really struggle to reproduce very natural real time uh, quantities in, in this extremely simple quantum mechanics model. So now we proceed to construct the real time path integral uh, this gets a bit technical. I won't go, go through all of it. We've got to write our X of T in terms of classical solutions and fluctuations. We're going to integrate over every one of these uh, fluctuation modes in its complex plane. Um, the path integral becomes a sum of terms, actually an infinite sum of terms, where one for each uh, classical solution. And then we're going to uh, flow the exponent downhill. Here it is in this uh, very simple picture of, of, of a single mode. Uh, we're flowing it downhill. Uh, there are what are called gradient flow equations, tell you how to do that. And, uh, and then, what, then what you can learn from this is uh, how, the, how quickly the exponent goes to minus infinity, uh, causing the integral to converge. Now, actually, it happens you can solve these flow equations analytically. Uh, this will be, uh, although they are PDEs, uh, first sight, they're a bit scary, but uh, you can solve them analytically uh, near the saddles and then off at infinity. And here they are. These are actual analytic solutions of the flow equations. Uh, if I take uh, uh, essentially a sine wave initially, uh, which is purely um, in the 45 degree direction, because that's where um, the, the trivial thimble is at 45 degrees. So you, you take your paths to make the kinetic term i x dot squared um, negative and real, you go at 45 degrees. So the, the thim thimble sort of starts off at 45 degrees in the space of, um, of, um, of x. And then as you flow it, um, the imaginary part uh, changes uh, differently to the real part. I, I won't dwell on this, uh, but the and, the, and then this height function plummets uh, uh, super uh, very quickly as you, as you flow off the thimble. At large X, the height function decreases faster than quadratically on the thimble. And that's, one has to show that by analyzing the PDEs, the flow, equations. And this means there exists a bounding Gaussian theory. So there's some Gaussian theory which bounds the full uh, nonlinear theory. And uh, so at, for every path on the thimble, uh, the uh, complexified path on the thimble, the height function is bounded by a Gaussian theory. And this actually suffices to prove that the path integral exists. So you'll be happy to learn that at least for uh, simple uh, x to the fourth and other 
uh, monomial theories, one can show that the path integral, real-time path integral does exist. There's some technical details. Uh, the proof relies on Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem using that bounding Gaussian theory, and also on the bochner minloss theorem, which is uh, the usual way one uses to prove that um, a well-defined measure exists. And this essentially uses the characteristic function of the, um, uh, of, so it's easier, it turns out, to show that the characteristic function exists, and this implies that the measure is well-defined. Now, I also want to note that the sum over classical solutions here generally does not converge, okay? And this is something which is not mentioned, for example, in Feynman's book. Uh, the fact that sum does not converge means that in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the propagator is in general not a well-defined function. It's only a distribution. It's not uh, continuous and uh, only integrals of it uh, against smooth functions are well-defined. However, if you do smooth it, if you smooth the propagator, it does converge. This is, for example, for the quartic oscillator, if we calculate the Feynman propagator as a function of time and smooth it in this way, so, so just smooth it uh, with respect to the initial time, then what you find is that at short distance, you get the usual term uh, coming from the kinetic, the free particle contribution. And at longer times, you get this fairly uh, wild function. It does converge, but the precise function it converges to depends on the smoothing. Uh, here it is in space and time. Uh, you see the Feynman propagator squared, which is the amplitude to start at a given position at t equals zero and to end up anywhere inside this quartic well um, is a very intricate function. I mean, this is a, a, a tremendous interference pattern. And, um, and you can see the classical solutions here. The classical solutions describe the, um, uh, the, uh, describe the uh, caustics in the interference pattern. There's a very close interplay between the quantum and classical pictures. You, I just want to say that you are now running over time. So. Okay, fine. So I'm almost done. Uh, the weak density, uh, yeah, this is a, a new concept, uh, another concept I don't really have time to introduce, but uh, Aharonov et al. introduced a, a quantity showing the influence of the quantum system, so X of T, on any measurement you make on the system between state, state preparation and strong measurement. And so here it is, this is a weak uh, density. This quantity is interesting because it allows you to calculate the influence of your quantum system on any possible measurement made during uh, the evolution of the quantum system. And in fact, this is how space-time should emerge in quantum geometric dynamics. We are very small things. Our measurements can't possibly influence the universe. Uh, despite what some people think. Um, and uh, uh, so, so we, are, we are weakly measuring the universe and um, uh, using, nevertheless, using this full description of quantum mechanics, we should see how a classical universe emerges from that, uh, from the quantum description. I'm just going to show you some pictures to end We've applied this method. As I said, path integrals are everywhere. And in fact, all of the interference patterns people measure in radio astronomy are path integrals. Uh, one follows photons all the way across the universe, adds up the phases and interferes them to get the intensity people detect in a radio telescope. Uh, one of the sort of frontier fields is gravitational microlensing. And it turned out that in spite of uh, many years since Einstein's paper, nobody had actually been able to compute the interference pattern due to a binary gravitational, uh, to do anything except a point, a single point lens that was computed fairly early. But for example, a binary lens or anything more complicated 
the relevant path integrals were just too difficult to perform, too oscillatory, and people put them on supercomputers and they didn't converge. Using this method, you can compute these integrals very straightforwardly. And here are the interference patterns for a binary gravitational lens. There's one lensing mass here, roughly, another lensing mass there. These are the caustics, which uh, Einstein computed in 1936. Um, and so microlensing events are where the background star travels across this pattern and you see spikes in the intensity, which formally go to infinity as, uh, as the lens passes a caustic. Uh, nobody had calculated these patterns. What is the wave optics version of this uh, geometric optics picture? Here it is. And it's very beautiful because the fringe spacing directly tells you the mass of the masses of the lens. So you cannot get that information from the uh, geometric optics picture, but you can from the wave optics. And here's a more complicated lens on the right with uh, multiple lenses at different redshifts. So all of these integrals are doable, meaning that this way of calculating path integrals um, is, is uh, certainly opening new frontiers for applications. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Neil, for your talk. Uh, so, questions, please? Let's see, I have uh, one question and one uh, a little recollection of Lefschetz. Oh, good. Um, the question to Neil is simple. Has your new research into path integrals changed your views in any way uh, about using them to define a wave function of the universe? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it has. Um, but I would say I don't trust any previous results. Any previous results by me or any previous results by, by you? <laughs> by anyone. Anyone, okay. It, it, it has led me to distrust um, all claims. Okay. Uh, I think uh, y y your claims were part of it, but uh, when I look at fields like holography, I see people talking about the wave function for gravity and uh, frankly, this kind of work, which I'm discussing, has not been done in that context. Yep. And I don't, you know, essentially people talk in very classical terms about the gravity part of the story. And uh, that's just incorrect. Uh, it is perfectly possible to have multiple classical space times interfering with each other. And mm -hmm. I don't think that is taken into account. And certainly if you look at papers uh, in the literature uh, by the more, uh, let's say, the, the people who are more honest about this, I think there's an admission that they don't know how to decide um, in general which saddles are relevant or not relevant. And so basically you pluck some classical saddle out of thin air and you claim maybe this is relevant. You know, uh, that's just not the way to do it. You need to find and show the classical saddle is relevant. It's a unique, there should be a unique uh, answer to that question. So I, I would say we haven't done the work. You know, it's right. as, simple, as simple as that. And the uh, same, apply, just... same applies to black holes, by the way. Same applies to black holes. In the real time picture, there should be uh, an unambiguous uh, description of the formation and evaporation of a black hole. And the way you find it is by considering the paths. And uh, uh, since it's a tunneling process, there is no real path. So you have to find the complex paths and you have to show which ones are relevant and which ones are not relevant. But in principle, this may be totally answerable within Einstein's theory of general relativity and using the path integral in the way I described. There's no evidence, I believe, that you need anything more than that. Okay. But nobody has done the work. Uh, just a reminiscence about um, Lefschetz. 
who was a great Russian math mathematician uh, who, who was at Princeton when I was a student. I don't know if you know that he lost both of his hands in Russia. Yes. In, a, um, in a, some kind of accident. And he had two uh, Russian prostheses, which were uh, hands made out of solid iron. Right. Uh, I don't know how he functioned like this. You could always tell when he's in the library because he couldn't use those hands to turn pages in a book, but he could turn the pages by sounding on the uh, table. Wow. The book would jump up and he would flip the page. Wow. So it was a little distracting <laughs> to have Lefschetz in the library with you, right? Because it was one day after another, right? Well, that's incredible. In the book. That's incredible. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so that, so that isn't known among the Russians or? I... That's a marvelous story. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, Sergei Sidirakov is next question. Hi, Neil. Um, Hi. Yeah, first, actually, I want to comment about your last, um, like what you said about black holes uh, and path integral. In fact, we have a paper, uh, me, Dima Levkov, and uh, Fyodor Bezrukov, where we did uh, more or less along, what, along the lines of what you okay. suggest. So we have a, like a description how to um, go from solutions which describe classical collapse, then analytically continuing into um, in, uh, in the parameters, okay, so in the en in energy, when, uh, sorry, classical, when I say classical collapse, it's like a process where there's classical scattering rather. So actually yeah. not subcritical solutions. So, you know, like okay. just, um, uh, bounces. Right. And then um, by analytic continuation, go to the regime where we expect classical collapse, but then uh, that procedure picks up certain tunneling solutions evolving well in our case they evolve in uh, complex time but they originate from real-time solutions so yeah I, about this point that we don't need to go to complex time i'm, I'm not sure I, we probably do need but okay that's maybe more technical why why because singularities come so we see that the singularities of the solution they come and and basically would cross the real-time axis and to avoid them we have to deform the contour yeah then then i'm uh suspicious well we we, we shall it, discuss it, that but it's i mean it's, no i i think to, to a very large extent and, and the, yeah. the regime where kind of your method and our method applies we give this we get the same result yeah okay. then there are some discrepancies in potentials where um i think our method would predict going to complex plane yeah with, with the contour with the time contour and it's okay. kind of necessary because of this yeah, if it's necessary, then you would say the saddle is not necessarily a saddle. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, actually, the, the criterion, I mean, your, your work is very interesting to to, describe, to understand. I mean, this is a criterion for the saddle, I mean, to argue that they're relevant. Our argument was more heuristic. We said that they are relevant because they are analytic, they are analytic continuation of, of the, of the surely relevant classical ones. I see. And we checked this in, in a bunch of quantum mechanical models and it, it worked really. Okay, no, I, I will look at your papers, thank you. Yeah, and another, I have a question. So it's very interesting. I mean, uh, I'm very interested with your, your application to lensing. And I was wondering to what extent it can be applied to scintillation of radio waves. Yes. where uh, basically the lensing field itself is random field. So, okay, so it can be generated numerically yes and then yeah to what i mean can your method be applied to numerics when we generate like lensing field like numerically as a random yes uh, i'm yes i'm smiling because my student uh, job felbrugger has in fact done all these calculations and i'm just holding up the papers uh, -huh. so, uh yes we've looked at scintillation there's a beautiful old paper by michael berry uh-huh which talks about universal features of uh, scintillation. You know, you get certain caustics and these are classified by catastrophe theory. And then each one has a different scaling with, uh, uh -huh. with frequency and, and so on. Um, the trouble is that Berry did everything analytically and in an approximation, which is not actually, um, it doesn't give you a good picture. It, it only it relies on the extreme peaks, which are extremely rare. So, uh, so yeah, so Job has done the analogous calculations for scintillation patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, 
numerically, and these are absolutely doable. Oh, cool. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Igor Volovich. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. In the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the sum of the photopologies for, for geometry. I would like to comment that it is not a well-defined notion because there exists Markov theorem, the problem of diffeomorphism of photo, for manifolds is analytically unsolvable. This is comment. Uh, so, sorry, I wasn't, I, I, I don't think I mentioned uh, some of the topologies. Uh, that's, that's- For geometry, you said. Is it? Uh, four geometries. I see what you mean. Yes, I did men mention the sum over four geometries, but right. But geometry is so. I, I agree with you. I think it is not known uh, how to handle the sum over different topologies. No, um, no it's not only unknown. It never it's never been known. <laughs> right. No, mm. I I don't have anything to say about that. Yeah, I consider this is a very important problem for quantum gravity. I agree. And then I would like to ask you a question. You wrote classical, semi-classical expansion in a very nice form. You have just oscillating factor classical action and then integral with measures. Can you say something about the structure of these measures, the mu? Yes, I can. Um, let me go back to that formula. Yes, here it is. So just to emphasize, this is not semi-classical, this is exact. Uh, this is an exact formula, um, and uh, so, sorry? It looks like semi-classical. It does, but it's not semi-classical, it is exact. What this is the difference? The, what is the difference? This is the exact formula. It, it, there's, there's no expansion in h-bar yet. It is a function of h-bar, but I've not expanded in h-bar. This formula is exact. So I took to an exact path integral, which is defined by integrating over all real fluctuations, delta x. And then I simply deformed the contour uh, into these different thimbles. And so the thim each, each classical saddle has a thimble, and then I must integrate the full integral over that thimble. Now, so what is this measure? Uh, first approximation, you can think of the measure as a Gaussian um, and, and in the very simplest approximation, it's a Gaussian which describes a free particle. In measure theory, it's known as the Wiener measure, and that would be the simplest case. So what, the, what this measure is, is a sort of nonlinear generalization of the Wiener measure. It's not necessarily Gaussian, it has uh, some definite tails. Its width and, and its structure depends on h-bar, and you can calculate this by uh, solving the uh, the flow equations, uh, which are, you can calculate the thimble by solving the flow equations. And then of course you have to integrate over it to get the quantum theory. Now, uh, there's also a phase. This phase arises from changing variables or, or actually just deforming the contour. You have uh, D delta XM in the measure for each fluctuation mode. And now you, move the path into the complex plane. And of course it becomes a complex number, which has a phase. So the real part of this goes into the positive part of, uh, it goes into the, the D mu, the measure, but the phase remains. And then what happens is if you do take the limit H bar goes to zero, um, you, you see, you notice this phase doesn't depend on H bar at all. There's no dependence here. So everywhere on the thimble, you have some phase. If you take H bar to zero, Essentially, the thimble becomes very narrow and focuses the, um, the measure on a, on, a, on a region just uh, very near to the saddle. In that limit, this phase becomes essentially pi over four or minus pi over four, which, are the, uh, which is what happens with the Maslow uh, index. It's pi over four or minus pi over four, depending on um, the number of zeros in the classical solution. Thanks, you know, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, last question from Alexander Zaharov. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would like to, to comment uh, your last slide when you considered gravitational lensing. 
So, yeah. yes, this one. Uh, first of all, about uh, the Gucci Watson paper. Yes. Uh, this paper is irrelevant for gravitational microlensing because the Gucci Watson considered limit for wave optics and geometrical optic approximation. And they concluded that you have to use uh, you have to use uh, wave optic approximation wave when wavelength is uh, high uh, is greater than uh, Schwarzschild. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Schwarzschild, uh, Schwarzschild radio. That's right. But for gravitational microlensing is relevant because uh, practically observ you observations were done with optic wave uh, uh, optical wavelengths is much shorter. And Thank second, you. about caustics. Yeah. So you said that uh, Einstein considered this caustic with cusps and and faults. It's yeah. not correct, because, but because practically uh, uh, later on in Schneider paper, uh, Schneider and other considered uh, fault singularity, but uh, Schneider and Weiss and uh, my paper was were considered uh, uh, cusp type singularity and magnification near this singularity. But Einstein didn't consider these kinds of singularities. No, th thank you for the In correction. classical paper, sorry. For... Thank you for that correction. Einstein just did these uh, point mass. He did Yes, point mass, but it's it's unstable singularity, as you yes. know, according to yes. catastrophe theory, it's unstable. Correct. Uh, on the first point, uh, this is, you see the number which appears if you put everything into dimensionless form. As you said, uh, the number depends basically on the ratio of the wavelength of the radio waves to the Schwarzschild radius corresponding to the lens mass. Yes, exactly. If the wavelength, Watson. If the wavelength is shorter uh, than the uh, Schwarzschild radius, then you see geometric optics. If the wavelength is of order, <laughs> is of order, uh, and, and, and that amounts to this criterion whether this number omega is much bigger than one or is of order one. Now you see if I take, uh, so by lowering the frequency of the radio waves, obviously I make their wavelength longer, and, um, and then uh, I can make this number omega smaller. So if we go to 100 megahertz, you know, we reduce this by 10, if we go to you know, 10 to the minus two of a solar mass, uh, then omega will be down to about 100. And now you will start to see interference effects like, uh, like what I was showing. So, uh, so this picture will work if what we're looking for are Jupiters orbiting stars in the galactic bulge and See, but the, there's another problem, which is that seeing, uh, being able to resolve these features will require us to have a radio telescope of something like a thousand kilometers baseline. Um, but this should be feasible. Um, so, so it's certainly very challenging to see that, but given what people have done with the Event Horizon Telescope, um, it looks like this should be possible with radio waves. Yes, but the question is, uh, it was remarked about terminology. Because yes. microlensing, it, according to Wamsgans ter terminology, microlensing, it means mass has to be stellar or substellar masses. Because yes. in this case, for cosmological distances, uh, angular resolution will be microsecond. That is origin of this terminology. But if, and you, as, according to Pachinsky's suggestion, Yes. Uh, people observed uh, microlensing in optical band. True. So Th this... that is that is terminological remark. So no, because... okay, fine. I, I, I agree. You... But I think the uh, microlensing has been very successful in discovering planets in the galactic bulge. Yes, yes, but, but... 2000 have been discovered. So they are there, but I totally agree. They have to be observed in radio, not in optical, in order to see this effect. And that yes, is yes. Yes, 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 exactly. Right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Neil, for very interesting talk and lively discussion. Thank so you. 